Welcome. First Baptist Church, Charleston, Arkansas. Welcome to those who are online. Would you take your Bibles, please? Matthew chapter 6. We're ready for the heart of the Sermon on the Mount. We began with the conclusion on Sunday morning. Sunday night we did the introduction. Last night we covered the passages where Jesus talked about elevating righteousness from the righteousness that was wrongly perceived in the Old Covenant to surpassing righteousness through Jesus Christ. And now tonight we're going to look at the three basic acts of righteousness according to Judaism. Jesus goes with these three. Here are three specific things that everyone who's right with God should be doing. So, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now, wait a minute. Didn't he tell us to do our works in front of men? Look at chapter 5, verse 16. Chapter 5, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So there he says, do your good deeds in front of people. But here he says, don't do them in front of people to be seen. In other words, you do your good works, you let your good works be seen, so the glory goes to God. But you never do your good works, so the glory goes to you. You don't do it to make yourself look good, you do them to make God look good. So he says, if you do things to be seen by them, you'll have no reward with your Father in heaven. Reward is a very big word in this chapter. He's going to talk about we as God's people have a great reward coming, and I'm glad that we do. So he says, When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. Now there's two totally different interpretations of the trumpets. So let me give you both interpretations. See which one you think it is. One is they had giving boxes for their offerings at the temple. They did not pass offering plates. They had giving boxes. And on the top of those boxes, they had these very ornate spiral mouths to those boxes that curled around and went up and they were made out of metal. And most of the money that was given, maybe all the money that was given, was coinage. They didn't have paper money. So what would happen if you brought in quite a few coins and you start chunking them into this thing and they start those coins circling around and clanging on that and making a noise as they went in. And when somebody takes a wheelbarrow load of coins and they start throwing all these coins in there, everybody turns around to see who's giving all that money. And some people say they call that the trumpets on the money box. So that's one interpretation. The other interpretation is this. Like a king, before he does something, He would have a royal fanfare. He would have trumpeters. And the trumpeters would blow their horns and say, everybody watch what the king's going to do. Only this time it's not a king. This time it's a person who's going to give to someone in need. So before he gives the money to someone in need, he's got someone to play the trumpet in front of him to say, everybody look at me, I'm going to give. Now either way, They're doing it to show off. 
They're doing it to make themselves look good. They are saying, I am such a great believer. Look at me. Look at how much I give. I'm wonderful. A very interesting comparison to this would be in Luke chapter 18 where you have a Pharisee who goes to the temple to pray and a publican who goes to the temple to pray. And the Pharisee stands up and says, I thank God I'm not like other men. I'm better than they are. He's sounding his own trumpet, isn't he? Well, when you give, you don't give to be seen. In this occasion, it says, when you give to the needy, you're giving for two purposes. You're giving, number one, because there's a person in need. But you're giving, number two, because you want to honor God and let God help you help that person in need. You're giving to glorify God if you're genuine. You don't give to show off. And so he uses a special word here. When you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues. Whoa. Hypocrites. Boy, we all know about that word. When I was growing up in Fort Smith, Arkansas, at that time when I was maybe 11, 12, 13 years old, there was only one TV station that you could get in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Channel 5. That was it. And we would watch on Saturday afternoon, and they had a Saturday afternoon theater movie every Saturday afternoon. It was called Academy Theater. And when it came on, you would see this curtain like on a stage and the curtain has the stage closed, and on the outside of the curtain were these two weird masks, M-A-S-K-S, masks. And one mask had this big smiley face on it, and the other mask had this grotesque frown on it. Did you ever see those drama masks? In biblical times and even before the New Testament times, the Greek people, the Greek-speaking people, especially in the land of Greece, they had two types of plays. They had plays that were tragedies, and they had plays that were comedies. And so in those days, you didn't see the face of the actor. The actor wore a mask. And if the, the actor is in a comedy, he's wearing the mask with the smile. And if the actor is wearing a mask and has a frown, he's in a tragedy. Something bad's going to happen to this guy. Right? Now, what did I tell you about that? The name for those masks was hypocrites. That's what those masks were called. They were the hypocrite's mask because they were the mask of someone pretending to be something they weren't. And what is a hypocrite? A person who pretends to be something good when they're not, right? So when you give so people see you, you're just pretending to serve God. What you're really serving is yourself and your ego. But on the other hand, if you give not to be seen, but you give to please God to help the person in need, then you're not a hypocrite. You are genuine. You're real. And Jesus said, when you give, in fact, he's going to say a little bit more about this. He says, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues on the streets to be honored by men, I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, 
Do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Can you do that? But you get the idea, don't you? What does it mean? Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing? Don't tell anybody. Keep it to yourself. Give it and let God be glorified by it. But don't take any of the glory. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. So that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And God has an eternal reward. He says, if you even just give a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus and you give it to glorify God, you have a reward in heaven. It's eternal. But if you give it to be seen so people think you're great, then you've already got your reward from men. You won't get one from God. Very simple, isn't it? One of the basic things about God's people is that God wants us to be like Him. Isn't that right? Is God a good giver? He's the greatest giver. Every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from our Heavenly Father, in whom there's no variableness nor shadow of turning, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Our God is the greatest giver. He gives to meet our needs. He never fails. He's a great giver. We cannot be right with God and want to hoard everything and keep it for ourselves. We cannot be right with God and be stingy. Godly people are giving people. And when God lays it on their heart to give, they give. Well, who should you give to? What should you give to? Pray about it. Let the Spirit lead you. Let the Spirit show you how to give your money. Let the Spirit show you when to give your money. Let the Spirit show you how much of your money to give. It's not for me to tell you how much you should give. I have no idea how much you should give. I just need to worry about how much God wants me to give. And I need to give it, just like you need to give it. We need to be givers so we can be godly. That's important. I do not believe churches need to take money from the government. I believe that God's people can give what our churches need. We don't need money from the world. God's people, God can provide for God's people so God's people can give to the things God wants given to. We don't need to be hypocrites. Don't show off. When God lays it on your heart how much to give to your building campaign, don't tell people about it. Just give it. Right? Don't say I've got to have my name on the wall. You got to put up there, I gave this many thousand dollars. No. Just give what God wants you to give. God will bless it. He'll bless it. And you know what? If God's people do this, there'll be more than enough money given. God will take care of it. He'll multiply it. He'll, He'll make it get bigger. Well, the next one, Giving, praying. Look at verse 7. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. You see back up in in verse 3, 
they wanted to be, or verse 2, they want to be honored by men. And this one, they want to be seen by men. So he says, I tell you the truth, they have received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your father who's unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Does that mean you can't pray in public? No, that's not what it means. But what it does mean is this. When you do pray in public, don't make a show out of yourself. Don't try to pray in such a way that people are going to think you're something special. When you pray in public, keep it simple and pray for the group and get to the point. Never will forget one Sunday morning, my home church in Fort Smith, the pastor made a mistake and called on a guy to pray that didn't know when to quit. And this literally happened. And the guy had prayed for about 15 minutes for the benediction. And the pastor spoke from the pulpit and said, everyone who's ready to go, you may go. Brother so-and-so will catch up on his praying while we're gone. And we all left. <laughs> he was still praying. You see, when you're leading public prayer, it's not about you, it's about God. And he's leading the group, but he forgot the group, he was just praying for him. That's not right. That's not right. So he says then, go to your, your room, close the door, pray to your father who's unseen. Now, I have found in my own prayer life that I need some places to go to to pray where I can be alone to pray. And I want to challenge you, if you've not tried this, I want you to do what Jesus said. If you're going to spend time with just you and the Lord in prayer and you don't want to be seen by other people, you want to just spend time with the Lord alone, find a place where you can be alone and when you find that place, Leave your phone in another room. Leave your computer in another room. Leave your TV or your radio or your music, whatever. Leave it in another room unless you want to play hymns while you pray, something godly while you pray. But do it so you can focus just with you and God. And he says... When you do this, then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Well, if He knows what you need before you ask Him, why do you ask Him? Because He wants you to. You see, He's the Father and we're the child. And a good father always wants his children to ask him for good things. A good father is always ready to hear his child ask for good things. He delights in the voice of that child. And God delights in your voice when you ask him. That's why Jesus said, ask It'll be given you. Seek, you'll find. Knock, it'll be opened unto you. You have not because you ask not. Does he know what you need before you ask? Absolutely. But he wants us to ask. And he delights in answering. Wow. You don't have to babble on like the pagans. And use empty, meaningless phrases over and over and over. No, you don't need that. You just need to make it simple and speak truth with the Father and ask. We don't tell God we ask. We don't command God we seek His will. So if we're going to receive a reward, we do it this way. Now skip, if you will, 
to verse 16. The first act of righteousness was giving. He said, don't let your right hand know what your, or left hand know what your right hand is doing. Give secretly, your Father in heaven will reward you. When you pray, don't pray to be seen by men in public. Spend a lot of time alone with God in prayer. And God will reward your prayer life. Verse 16, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. How would they disfigure their faces? Well, in their culture, the way they did it, they would take charcoal or soot or dirt or mud and they would wipe it across their foreheads and down their cheeks and on their arms and they would walk around for everyone to see, I'm fasting, I'm really serious about this matter before God. And here's how they would fast. They would get up before sunrise and they would have a huge breakfast. And then as soon as the sun came up, they wouldn't eat anything all day long and they walk around with a frown on their face. Look at me, I'm fasting. I'm fasting. And when the sun went down, they'd have a huge supper and clean up. Is that fasting? No, that's showing off. That's being a hypocrite. What is fasting? Fasting is when you have a real need in your, your life to get closer to God. Maybe there's a real need that you need God's help with. Or maybe there's someone that you really need to intercede for strongly. And so you go to God and you say, Lord, I'm not going to eat today. The time I would have used eating, I'm going to spend that time and more time. I'm going to forget about what my body needs. And I'm only going to focus on this spiritual need. And God, wherever I have to go today, I'm not going to let people know I'm fasting. I'm not going to do any bragging about fasting. I'll tell my wife, Lord, so she won't think I'm nuts. But I'm not going to tell anyone else. And Lord, I just want to draw close to you. I need your guidance. I need your help. Here's a person I'm lifting up to you. I really love them, God. I know you love them more than me. Work in their life. Show me what to do for my part. And you spend that time drawing closer to God. Now I want to warn you. You may have health issues that would prevent you from fasting. If you have such health issues, you know it. If you're not sure about it, talk to your doctor. Make sure it's okay for you to physically fast. But I want to say to you, this is one of the three things that Jesus talked about as an act of righteousness and how much do we do this one? How much time do we Baptists spend fasting and praying? And I'm reminded when the disciples said, Lord, why couldn't we cast this demon out of this young boy? We cast other demons out. Why couldn't we cast this demon out? And the Lord answered, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting. Jesus cast out the demon, but the apostles couldn't. And remember, they didn't get to fast till Jesus left. While Jesus was with them, they could not fast. They had to rejoice with the bridegroom. But once he goes back to heaven, then you find Acts 13 the five pastors, Paul and Barnabas and these five, fasting and worshiping the Lord. 
fasting is something I was never taught growing up in church. Fasting is something I have taught very little. I'm no expert on it. But I know this. God blesses it. God blesses it. If you do it to glorify him, he'll bless it. If you do it so you can tell people what a wonderful Christian you are, you've got your reward. He won't reward you. You already have it. Wow. Did you see the parallelism in the giving, the praying, and the fasting? Everyone was, don't be a hypocrite. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't be like the hypocrites. Don't do your acts of righteousness to be seen. Do them in private and your Father who sees what is done in secret, He will reward you. Now, we get to the very heart of the Sermon on the Mount. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. This then is how you should pray. I love this. I love this. This is how you should pray. Our Father, who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, our sins, our debts, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. So what he gives us is an outline for how to pray. Now, it's great to repeat this. I really enjoy just repeating it for you right then. I think every Christian should have this prayer memorized and be able to repeat it at any time. And when my son was pastoring up in Illinois, every Sunday morning he would lead in the initial prayer at church, and when he came to the time for the amen, before they said amen, and then he said, let's all pray together the way our Lord taught us to pray. And they would repeat the model prayer every Sunday morning as a congregation. I thought it was a great thing to do. But that's not his purpose. His purpose is to be a skeleton that you put meat on the bones. Its purpose is to be an outline that you follow this pattern when you pray. Now, I know a lot of people like to use a lot of acronyms and things for how to pray. I don't think any of those can match the outline that Jesus gives us right here. All right? First, in prayer, the first thing you should do in prayer is worship. Now, I'm not talking about an emergency prayer where you're driving down the highway and a car tries to cross the middle lane and almost hits you head on. You say, Lord, help me. You don't do worship prayer then. You pray, help. God, I need you, right? But I'm talking about when you get off in that room by yourself or get off on that mountaintop like Jesus did by himself. And you're going to spend time in prayer and you start first with, our Father. First question about our Father. How many times in the Old Testament did they pray our Father? And the answer is zero. No one in the Old Covenant ever prayed Father. Every prayer in the Old Testament goes like this. Almighty God, 
we bow before you. Lord God Almighty, we come before you. They never began the prayer with Father. Who was the first person to pray Father? It was Jesus, God's only begotten Son. And what does He let us do? Because we have received Him, we have become children of God, God is our Heavenly Father, we have the privilege of praying directly to the Father. And we can say, Abba, Father, just like Jesus did. Now, Father, sometimes I have people say to me, Brother Mike, I can't pray that. Well, why can't you pray that? Well, my father was terrible. My father beat my mother. My father abused me. My father hurt me and deserted me. My father was terrible. I could never pray Father. But Jesus said pray Father. So what I would try to teach them would be this. Imagine if you had had a perfect Father. Imagine if you had a Father who never failed you, a Father who never harmed you, a Father who always protected you and loved you, and provided for you. Imagine the perfect father you always wish you had, and God is even better. And start saying, God, I had a terrible father, but I know you're nothing like him, and I want to pray to you. Thank you for being my father. Our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name. You've got the name Father and you have hallowed be thy name. A person's name stands for their character. person's name stands for their authority. God the Father has all power. He's omnipotent. He has all knowledge. He's omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He is awesome in everything he does. His authority is above all. And his character is love and mercy and compassion and grace and goodness and faithfulness. Yes, even jealousy in the good sense not the bad sense. He has righteous anger because sin hurts people. And he hates when sin hurts people. He is, his character is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His character is eternal. That means he is absolutely dependable and he has the power to do whatever his will is. Amen to that? The first thing we do when we pray is we say, Father, thank you for being my Father. And I want to honor your name. I want to worship your name. I want to worship you. I want to thank you for being the loving God that you are, the perfect God that you are, the powerful God you are. 
And I want to bow myself before you right now. That's the right way to begin your prayer time with God. Secondly, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom and your will Let your kingdom come, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And right now, Father, I only want to ask you for things that are good for your kingdom. I don't want to pray for anything that would harm your kingdom. And Father, right now, I want to submit to your will. I'm not coming to pray to you to get you to do my will. I'm coming to pray so you can show me your will and I will do it. I'm giving you control. You are God and I'm not. That's worship. You are bowing your life before God in availability. Here I am, I'm yours. So the first part of the outline is worship. Have we asked him for anything for ourselves yet? No, this prayer is about God. The focus is on God first. Now, once we have done this, then this is going to change the things that we request. So the second part of the outline is requests. And his first request that Jesus mentions is, give us today our daily bread. Now, daily bread can refer to more than one thing. First, daily bread refers to our physical needs. We all need food, and basically we need it every day. Unless we're fasting, we need food for that day, don't we? So we're asking for our physical need. But we're not just asking for our physical needs because the Bible says, and Jesus quoted, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. Which means that bread there is not physical bread. Bread there is spiritual bread, which is God's word. We feed on God's word. Years ago when I was in college, I'm sure you've seen these. I think I may have seen some around here one time or another. Uh, they had little devotional books they put in the, in the dorms that were put out by M.R. DeHaan and Richard DeHaan, and the name of those was Our Daily Bread. And each one had a page for that date and it had a scripture passage and a little devotional. They wanted you to feed on God's Word every day, so they called it Our Daily Bread. It wasn't talking about a loaf of bread. It's talking about God's Word. Well, I want to say to you, this is both. In other words, God wants you to let him know what your needs are. Does he know what your needs are before you ask? We just read that a while ago. He knows what you need before you ask. But he wants you to ask him for your needs, both physical and spiritual. And that change every day. But pray and ask those. Second thing. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do we Christians sin? Yes, we do. And when we sin, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to repent and tell God about it and ask Him to cleanse us. And when we do this, then 1 John 1, 9 takes place. 
He's faithful and just. Forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we ask for this. We ask for forgiveness. But we also must forgive those who sin against us. If we want God to forgive us, we have to forgive others. In fact, right after this prayer, he says, if you're not willing to forgive others, I'm not going to forgive you for this. Does that mean you can't be saved? That's not what he's saying. But he's saying you're going to have problems being right with me if you don't forgive. Yes. There's no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. We're not confessing to be saved again. We're confessing so we can have fellowship with Him. We want to walk in fellowship with Him. And if we don't confess our sins, we lose the joy of salvation. Yes, exactly. I agree totally. All right. Forgive us. Now, a mistake that many people make in praying is this, and I've made this mistake before. I used to do this first in my prayer. I thought I had to ask the Lord to forgive my sins so I would be right to walk with Him in that fellowship, and when that fellowship was right, then I could really pray. So I would start my prayer off with this, but Jesus puts this, he doesn't make it the first request. Instead, Jesus puts worship first. You say, but I don't feel like worshiping. I'm not worthy to worship. He wants you to worship. And if you'll go ahead and worship him, he'll get your heart ready to confess your sins. And I say the order that Jesus gives it to us is the right order. I had it wrong for a long time. So, worship, request, first request, needs, second request, forgiveness, third request, lead us. But here it's lead us not. Lead us not into temptation. This doesn't make sense if you think about it. Why doesn't this make sense? The book of James says, Let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God, for God tempteth no man. So if God never tempts anyone, why does it say, Don't lead us into temptation? This is a figure of speech, and we have these in all languages. For example, if I said to you this statement, that dog won't hunt, what does that mean? That dog won't hunt. This idea is not going to work. But that's how we say it, that dog won't hunt, right? Or here's another one. It's raining cats and dogs. What does that mean? It's raining hard. That's all that means. It's pouring. It's raining cats and dogs. It's not literal. And this statement is like those statements. Here's what this statement means. It's a Jewish idiom. An idiom is a group of words that if you take them literally, they don't make sense. But everybody knows what they mean. Just like that dog won't hunt. It's raining cats and dogs. She drives me up the wall. Our language is full of idioms, right? So, this is a Jewish idiom. Lead us not into temptation. Here's what it means. Lord, please lead me. Because unless you lead me, I will fall into temptation every time. When do you fall into temptation? Every time you quit being led by the Spirit. Every time you quit following the Lord. You take your eyes off the Lord and what do you do? You trip and you fall. 
So, Lord, lead me or else I'll fall into temptation. Lead me today, Father. Let your spirit guide me. I want you to know that's a great thing to pray. And when you pray it, pray it something like this. Lord, today, while you're leading me, would you keep my eyes open spiritually so I'll see when you want me to speak to someone? So I will know when you want me to do something. Would you help me to have my eyes and my ears and my heart in tune with your spirit? So as you lead me through the day, I'll know when to speak and when to be quiet. That's leading. That's being available for the spirit to lead you. So we always want to pray for leading. And then number four is deliver us from evil or the evil one, Satan. That lady told me one time, she said, I never have to worry about that fourth one. She said, Satan never bothers me. You know what my thought was? My thought was, you're not worshiping and you're not trusting God for your needs and you're not forgiving and you're not being led by the Spirit because anybody does those things, Satan's going to attack you. Anyone who does God's will will be attacked. If you're not being attacked, you may not be doing too much for God. Right? Satan attacks those who are trying to do the will of God. If you don't believe that, just commit yourself to prayer. See how much he attacks your life when you commit yourself to prayer. He will attack you. But I've got good news. You can be delivered from the evil one's attacks. Greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. And God won't let him attack over and over and over. He'll let him attack for a season. And then God will give you a season of rest and a season of victory. And the next time he attacks, you'll be stronger to fight him the next time. It's good. It's good. So we have worship and we have request. And then we go back to worship. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And God, I just want to praise you and praise you. So you start with worship. And you end with worship. And in between you put request. W-R-W, if you want an acronym. Worship, request, worship. That's pretty easy, isn't it? You say, is it really? Does that really work? Absolutely. Absolutely, unequivocally, this works. This is how Jesus said to pray. And Jesus prayed all the time. I wonder how much worship of the Father Jesus did when he prayed whole lot. I wonder how much trust he had on the Father to meet his needs while I was here on earth. I think complete trust. The one thing Jesus never had to pray was, forgive me of my sins. He had none. He never sinned. But he was led by the Spirit. And he's delivered from the attacks of Satan and death and he had victory and he still does and he will forevermore and he said pray like this this is the heart of the Sermon on the Mount do your acts of righteousness to glorify God giving praying fasting and here's how you pray use the model prayer as your outline. Amen?
Tomorrow night we'll finish out. We'll have some good passages tomorrow night to look at. And I hope you'll be back with us when we open up God's Word again.